Okay, so I've announced this topic for a long time. Right in the beginning, we know the end. Uh, the end is going to be uh, the Taisho Canon, the Japanese Canon. Right? We know this. Uh, almost all people, if you want to study Buddhism or study a scripture seriously, uh, you, you need to consult Taisho Canon. Right? So it's a great canon and very easy to use. There's a lot of the uh, reason why it become a standard, and uh, but however, while people using there, a lot of the uh, uh, kind of the uh, 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 old stories or, or kind of the uh, 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 history behind that got sort of forgotten. Uh, even the Japanese probably don't remember what kind of effort being put behind that. Uh, so after a lot of people were uh, sacrificed themselves. Uh, use their own properties, for example, to, to, to as an office place. Uh, there's a lot of sacrifice uh, to make this happen. Uh, so we're going to introduce the Taisho Canon uh, throughout this lecture. Of course, uh, through this Taisho Canon, uh, we want to understand the Japanese canonical tradition. It is not coming to uh, the Taisho Canon didn't just emerge suddenly. Uh, before this, there are actually uh, many attempts. Uh, to compile canon in Japan. Uh, so then this one became uh, successful. Uh, it's based on, uh, uh, I, as I said, lots of work, uh, lots of work in history. Uh, so we introduced that, and more importantly, I want to kind of a, uh, re recover some kind of a historical memory. So they are going back to the time when Taisho canon was created. And it's going to be lots of interesting stories for this one as well. Uh, so here, Taisho edition, if you can recognize, I don't recognize, but I believe this is Taisho Emperor. Right? So why Taisho has been named as this? Because it was created during the Taisho reign, as right? a Japanese, Japanese emperor. Right? And this edition is actually not the first Taisho right? when it was created. Right? So after I want to identify the first volume, right? what, what it looks like. Actually, right now, I haven't been able to do that because the Taisho Canon was uh, uh, reprinted after uh, the Second World War. Uh, in the wartime, there's an air raid in uh, Tokyo at the destroyed warehouse. So the remaining printed copy, including the uh, paper type, uh, stencil, they all been destroyed. So in the 60s, after there's another uh, attempt to reproduce the Taisho. And this is actually even not belong to that Reproduction is actually a, a kind of a, a copy. A lot of the such kind of copy produced in Taiwan. Right? There are massive com campaign during the 80s, probably to bring this and bring it back to uh, mainland China. Right? Uh, so, so Master Jin Kong, for example, right? some of them heard of him. One of his effort is to uh, reprint the Taisho King and then send to uh, mainland China. Okay. Uh, before we go to this topic about Taishu, I actually want, I want to spend some time to introduce the pre-modern Japanese canonical tradition. It's a long history, as right? so I hope I can be clear. As I said, our interest is always, focus is always on the printed edition. Right? So, but however, before the printed edition or printing technology flourished in, in later time, uh, we have to remember the Japanese favor the writing of manuscript tradition much, much uh, more and longer than the Chinese. Uh, the Chinese entered into the printing age pretty quickly after technology was, was invented. We're talking about 9th, 10th century and the 11th century Then we see the first canon was printed. But not, it's not the case in Japan. The printing actually started to become do dominant only in the later Edo period. Right? That's the uh, 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 17th century, actually. The early 17th century when the Tokugawa uh, 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 military family took the power. Right? We see during the Edo period, actually printing flourished. Right? So we, then we saw uh, a couple of the printing editions. Before that, we're pretty sure the canon tradition existing manuscript, manuscript uh, kind of a, a stage uh, of course, influenced by Tang Dynasty China, because we know numerous uh, Japanese monks went to China and studied, and they brought back texts, 
and they, they reproduce text, and the easiest way to do that is to copy by hand. So there are government agencies being set up in Japan to specialize in reproduce Buddhist texts or canon, but, but they're, they hire scribes right, to do that. So that requires kind of a, a, a government support. The one thing about a manuscript edition is this is a problem facing uh, the disadvantage of a manuscript edition is that because of the scribe or the copy or different conditions, the manuscript edition, where out of the scribe or handmaking process, will always look different, right? Because of man-made reason or lots of other reason, uh, they are not going to be the same. Right? Each individual set, even you claim this comes from one edition, right? but they all look different. Right? So rather, it's very unstable because the manuscript can be shuffled or misplaced. Right? Very unstable. Right? Uh, but however, this kind of a manuscript culture actually dominated the Japanese uh, uh, culture. Right? Even today, you can see the Japanese just love transcribe scriptures. Right? Almost in every monastery, there are going to be a quiet room uh, to devote it for such purpose. So you can just go there and then transcribe the Heart Sutra, for example, which is short and, 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 and is so pervading. Right? So pervading. And uh, also, then, then what? Are, they, they, are, they, are, they are actually printed edition in Japan, right? not produced by the Japanese, but however imported from somewhere else. For example, I mentioned the frequent uh, contact between Japan and the China. And when we when we introduced Kaibao, Kaibao was done uh, in 983. Then right after that year, right? 984, uh, Japanese monk Chonin right, came to China and request a complete set right, that the emperor gave to him. So we know, actually, the Japanese did, indeed, they, they had uh, printed copies. And because they're so close to Korea, right, so if you sail to Korea, it's going to be so quick, right, from Tsushima just across the, the street. Right. So after the Koreans produced their cannon, the Japanese came frequently to request for the cannon. And one time, they even request to have to have the entire blocks, right? So they, they know this is a pressure, so they, they want the blocks as well. Of course, the Koreans will not give it, so give to the Japanese. Then the Japanese threaten to, to invade Korea, right? So there's lots of diplomacy regarding to that, right? related to that. Then the golden age of block printing came during the Edo period. As we know, Edo period uh, is a, a culture flourished, by right? well, you all know Japan is a samurai culture, right? But however, during this period, actually, the Bakufu uh, promote culture, right? promote culture, learning, Chinese learning included. And then printing started to become a business uh, because Chinese books got reprinted, right? And they sell on the market. Right? People want to pay to buy those books, right? And we know during the Edo period, uh, only the Chinese and Olanda Jin, right? the Dutch, were allowed to trade in Japan. Right? If you visit Nagasaki, this summer I went there. Right? There's Tejima, a little kind of a small island. Uh, you have a Dutch uh, 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 kind of a company uh, trading, and the Chinese. Right? There are Chinese uh, quarter, right? Koji Yashiki, where the Chinese merchants live. Then the books actually arrive, right? and we know Buddhist canon arrive, right? particularly Jashin canon. Right? Jashin canon. And, and the Japanese, during this time, then they tried to create their own canon. Right? So I have two examples. One is the Kenkai Ban edition and Tezikan Ban. Right? So we're working to introduce that. They, they are very unique, distinctive. So I have uh, one uh, <coughs> uh, kind of uh, evidence to prove the uh, printing technology has been used, but not for creating the entire canon but at least some scriptures, such as uh, Prajna Paramita, right? So this is called the Katsugaban, uh, uh, right? Because it, this kind of a printing, prints were always donated to, dedicated to Katsuga Shrine, right? Katsuga Shrine. So this start from the Nara period down to the Kamakura, right? So I'm holding this piece with me, right? So this is a photo of that, but during my stay in Japan, after I purchased this one, uh, it's very not not very expensive, but 
I'm not sure if it's real, authentic or not, but it says authentic, right? Uh, Kazuga Bank, right? If, if this is true, it's going to be a piece of relic uh, coming down from the, the, the at least the 15th, uh, 14th century, right? So Original paper? I want paper? to circulate this one so you can have a look. Right? So this comes from the uh, Japanese Asian printing technology. Uh, original paper? Yeah, I, I, they that, claim. That's, that's what I, I doubt, right? So you see, see what, what merchants do. This is sell for a profit, then they cut the entire scroll into sessions. Oh, I see. Just this line, they, they, they kind of decorate like this and sell to you. Okay. So maybe it's true or not. Maybe some of you can help me to uh, kind of uh, authenticate that. Right? So that shows the technology is quite advanced. And the two editions I want to introduce during the Edo period is one called Tenkai edition. Right? So this one is very unique. Right? The reason is that this is the only edition of the canon actually use the movable type technique. Right? So far we have been introduced the printing technique is largely a fixed wood block. Then you carve each character. When you made a mistake, probably the entire block just gone, right? So just ruined. But however, the movable, just like the Guggen, Guggenberg technology, you kind of a typeset is a movable, so it's, you can reshuffle all the typeset, right? And uh, do a new edition. The disadvantage is that when, uh, when, you, when you do a new project, then the previous block will be no longer there. You cannot reproduce any more copies. But this one, this happened exactly with the Tenkai edition. Tenkai is a monk's name, right? If you know the early Tokugawa history, this is going to be the, the one of the leading uh, 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 advisor to the first shogun, right? Yeah, right? so he, he was the man behind lots of policies and writings. And it was started and uh, uh, undertaken by this monk, right? So we still have copies of that, right? So this, I have uh, one copy. Uh, uh, prints here, right? so you can see uh, the, the typeset is actually uh, uh, beautiful, and uh, you have uh, all the elements of a canon, right? especially you have this uh, southern character here, right? and uh, the year printed here, and the Tenkai, right? his name is here. Right? He is the superintendent of the nation, right? so he has here. So this is one example, the only movable type uh, canon. So this canon, uh, so let, let's omit some of the details. Right? Move to the next one called Tetsukenban. Right? So this one, I examined this one by myself. Right? It's the reason why I was in Japan this summer, because the Japan Foundation just gave me money to stay there for two months, but not to study canon. I, I study a, a tradition in Japan called Obaku. So the reason is that I do Chinese Buddhism, right? Uh, but however, the monk I study called Yin Yuan, or Yingen Luki, right? that's his Japanese pronunciation, went to Japan in 1654 and founded a tradition in Japan called Obaku. Right? He, he was a Chinese. He was a Chinese. And he insists the temple be built following the Chinese style. Right? So this tradition in Japan famous for its culture, the like Ogaku culture, which is uh, 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 exotic kind of Chinese uh, uh, influence. And then he has a disciple, Japanese disciple called Tetsugen, right, who vowed to create a Buddhist canon. And Yingen gave this uh, Jiaxing edition, the main session to Tetsugen. Uh, Jiaxing, the main session is based on the northern tradition, uh, the main Yongle northern edition. Then Tezugan reprinted that, uh, reprinted that. Of course, it's not that simple, but there, there are lots of uh, 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 new, edition, new editions. Right? So then it started from this year, 1669, right? The finish about this year, right, 1681, right? This is one of the uh, major canon, right, during the Edo period. Right? It, it is absolutely very handy and uh, available at that time, right? No tie show at that time, so this became huge, hugely infer inferential. Right? Uh, actually, right, according to my study, right, so I've done some study about the first canon in Europe. Right? I'm, I care about this. Right? Where, when 
actually the Europeans or Westerners first receive a complete Chinese canon, or canon in Chinese. Right? So then I, I, the result is that the, the, the Tetsuken Bun right, might be the first one actually sent to Japan. Right? The history behind this has to be related to uh, the famous Max Muller. Right? So we all know Max Muller, a great scholar. Uh, I graduated from a program uh, about the study of religion. So he has been regarded as the founder of this discipline, study comparative of study of religion. And he has a publication project called Sacred Book of the East. Right? So some of you probably can still check out the book because the book itself is to translate uh, major uh, uh, sacred books, scriptures coming from the East, Indian, Tibet, Chinese, or Japanese. Right? So then he needs books. So then uh, the canon actually was discovered, right? So they know there's a Chinese canon. And uh, uh, this scholar called Samuel Bill, right, first noted, right? So there's a Chinese canon in his work, right? So this book called uh, Katina of Holy Scripture, actually published in 1871, now it's free online. Right? You can download this book. I, I think you can, it is very revealing if you read uh, what kind of knowledge Europeans, Westerners have about Chinese Buddhism, then that's one of the evidence. So Mueller, right, actually, he asked for a canon to both China and Japan, right? When the Iwakura Tomomi, well, one of the high court officials, right, so they, uh, as I said in Japan, right now is a fervor about the, uh, the uh, Yuma, for example, and uh, yae. So these are all the uh, Bakumatsu period uh, heroes who have helped to overthrow the, the, the Tokugawa and the re reinstate the uh, imperial rule. Right? And the Iwakura is one of them. Right? He belongs to the uh, emperor's kind of a, a close uh, officials. And uh, right after the Me Meiji Yixin, right? so Meiji restoration, the Japanese government sent out a huge uh, uh, kind of a uh, mission to the West to study what the West looks like. Right? So they want to reform themselves. And Iwakura was the leader. Right? Was the leader of this group of uh, Japanese officials. And when they arrived in London, Mueller contact him and uh, 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 and request for a canon. Right? He also requests sent a request to to Qing Dynasty in China. No no response. No response. Uh, Iwakura remembered this. So this is one of the photos of uh, uh, five of the chief officers, and uh, Iwakura is sitting in the middle. Uh, sitting in the middle. So this is uh, one of the photos of uh, Max Mueller. Max Mueller is uh, in his uh, later age. Uh, by the way, Mueller's diary, for example, uh, still exists, so you can check. So, and he has a very capable Japanese student of Nenjo Buyu. Right? So this is one of the essential figures in modern Japanese Buddhism. Right? He, Nenjo Buyu, by the way, is a monk. Right? Belongs to the Shinshu tradition. Right? So then Shinshu monks, they can marry, they, 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 have, a, uh, they, 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 they have their life. And uh, he studied with uh, Max Mueller. Right? Uh, I believe it should be this guy, right? So I can't. So this is one of his fellow, later also a professor, but it, however later passed away, if I'm incorrect, because Nanjo Buyo in his diary to, he, he mentioned this. He mentioned this. Uh, so then this catalog, right? So I've never been to uh, 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 London, so if I've been there, I, I want to investigate. It's still there, right? So the entire copy has been sent to the Indian office. It's still there, Indian office library right now. And uh, Samuel Bill was ordered to prepare a catalog. Right? So he did finish the job. But however, this book published but full of mistakes. So this book is also downloadable from Google Books. Right? And Nanjo Buyo. Right? Nanjo Buyo came and finished that. Right? So this is Nanjo Buyo's calligraphy. So Max Mueller is, is a scholar of Sanskrit. Right? So, Nan, so, so Nanjo Buyo came to study. His Sanskrit is very good. So this is about a uh, Buddhist poem and uh, written in different scripts. So Nanjo Buyo did that. So Nanjo Buyo came and uh, decided to retranslate or compile a different uh, 
uh, uh, catalog. So this becomes the catalog of the Chinese translation of Buddhist Tripitaka, a sacred canon of Buddhist Buddhists in China and Japan. Also downloadable from Google Book. But here you see the title, it says nothing about Tetsugan. Nothing about Obaku. It's actually the Tetsugan edition. Right? But he says, if you actually look, open the book, it has Chinese title there. It says, the, 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 the catalog of the Great Ming Dynasty. So lots of people said, okay, this is Chinese catalog. But actually it's not. It's not. It's a catalog of a uh, Japanese canon. Or maybe, indeed, Nanjo Buyo translate the catalog, right? If he checked the real canon or not, I don't know. But the catalog is contained in that Tetsukan collection. So more work needs to be done to understand exactly what's going on. Right? So this, these are the answers. I think uh, that should be correct, right? So even the uh, curators of the canon at the uh, Indian Office Library, I, I, I emailed sent him, I said, this is Obakuban. He said, no, 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 this is Chinese edition. So I think he probably got it wrong. Because I, if you read Nanjo Buyong's catalog, he said clearly, right? so this is uh, sent from Japan. Did, did you ask them to send a sample of, uh, of the, for instance, the cover or the inside? If they, if they provide two photos, we can easily identify whether it is Obaku or so-called uh, Yongle Roden Canon. Yeah, 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 sure. I, I'm pretty sure because Nanjo Buyo said that so clearly. He has a mm -hmm. diary, right? So he told us so clearly it's a Japanese canon okay. coming okay. from Japan. So only the only thing I, I can check is that if it's Tetsugan canon, it will include Tetsugan's own writing, and also Tetsugan's uh, uh, memorial to the to the Japanese emperor. Right? So oh. I, I I didn't see that, but I will go to London yeah. to examine that. So before Taisho, right, let, let's let's kind of zoom in. This is close to the time when Taisho was created. Then, before the creation of the Taisho, there are already attempts in Japan to create a new type of canon. Right? So there are experiments before Taisho. Right? So why Taisho became so uh, successful? Because it absorbed all this kind of uh, achievement. Right? So this edition, right, we call the small print canon, right? Uh, was actually compiled, edited by Fukuda Gyodokai, right? Fukuda Gyokai. And from 1881 to 1885. Right? So this canon, right, uh, used the Korean canon as its mother copy. As I mentioned, Korean copy is superior in quality. So everybody agree, agree upon that. Right? So we all collated. So, and also collated with other uh, Chinese editions, other Chinese editions. But however, his catalog, very interestingly, I mentioned during my lecture, a lay Ming Chinese monk called Zhi Xu wrote a catalog for the canon and a proposed to change the structure from Zhi Sheng's standard catalog to adopt the Tiantai model, right? Tiantai model. So he wrote this catalog based on his own, uh, his new proposal, right? but that never got adopted in China. But this edition apparently actually adopts this kind of a, a structure with modification. So it's kind of interesting. I didn't do a study of this. I think it's very interesting to see what's the uh, turnout. Right? Uh, then the next attempt is called the Mangji Canon. So this is the Mangji Canon, right? Uh, this one is actually uh, followed based on the small print canon, right? and all, also the Yonglu Northern Canon. Right? So Professor Long later can, can uh, kind of point it out if this is right or wrong. But however, so one of the major change, right? this is a revolutionary, revolutionary, later adopted by Taisho Canon is to completely give up this traditional Chinese system, Southern character acid. And we have been introduced this for a long time so far. This is one of the basic standard or <coughs> element for us to identify a printed edition. Right? We find that in all the prints. But however, 
starting from this point, the Japanese decide to give it up, right, for good. I think it's a good decision right, to give it up. Right? And then the cannon was finished. Right? So this is somehow a major achievement. Right? So then there's a supplement to the Mangji edition. We call this Mangji supplement, right? So the, the, the kind of a achievement for this one is that this one, since it's a supplement, it included numerous Chinese texts, right? Created in the late imperial China, such as Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. Normally, this will not get into the canon, except in the Jiaxing canon, which is a commercial edition. So everybody can get in, into that. But however, this canon, actually it was reprinted. It's available, right? as the Xinzang Dai Nihong Zokuzoku. Right? But however, if you use that, you will find their selection standard, they favor the Soto tradition. Right? So, uh, I studied Linji, by the way. Uh, so I noticed that actually there are fewer copies or recorded sayings, for example, from the Linzai tradition, and more from the Soto tradition. Right? So remember, so each, the characteristic of each canon, there are lots of them, but for this one, uh, it's it is the collection of the later sources in China. Right? So this is a, uh, its achievement. So it's still useful, by the way, especially for me. I studied the later period. So then, right, the Taisho Ken, the next is going to be the Taisho Ken. But however, we need to understand during the time when Taisho Ken was created. Right? It's about the 1930, right, 2030, around that time. Uh, if we study history, we know that's before uh, the, 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 the Japanese, the, J Japan already kind of a, uh, uh, occupied Korea right? so from 1905, if I remember correctly. 1910, 1905, it becomes a kind of a colony, and 1910 probably formally annexed Korea as part of the Japanese Empire. Right? So the rise of nationalism in Paris, Japan, right? so that kind of a uh, 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 atmosphere is everywhere, including Buddhists. Right? Everybody talking about Japanese are unique. Like Japanese is a unique nation, unique with a unique spirit, right? There's something got into the culture and uh, it reflected in all aspects, including Buddhism. Right? And during that time, because of the Japanese occupation of Korea, right, so they study the Korean canon. They have more awareness about the canonic tradition. Right? And more importantly, perhaps scholarly speaking, is the introduction of religious study, the Western-style philological study in East Asia through Japan. Right? The Japanese were among the first to uh, study with scholars such as Max Muller. So they study in Europe and brought back the most advanced technique or philological scholarship back to uh, uh, East Asia. And they were aware fully aware the most advanced scholarship lies in the Dunhuang discovery. So this is the cave discovered at the turn of the last century and it caused the sensation of revolution in the study of the Asian culture and Buddhism. Right? So the British, French, they all came to China and they did their expedition and uh, took the scriptures, texts back to uh, London and Paris. Right? So that's the most prominent, prominent learning during that time. And Japanese were part of this. Right? Japanese were part of this. Right? And then in addition to that, because Japan's advanced uh, status during that time, uh, they become the leader right, of the East Asian Buddhist network. Right? So one thing I want to emphasize is that the creation of Taishu is not completely a Japanese effort because evidence show it is clearly based on an extensive East Asian uh, Buddhist network. Right? So the evidence I have is this kind of a publication, the, the member list of the Society of Taishu publication. Right? It, is, it is published during the time when Taishu was compiled, right? not even published. Right? So then, then the, this book, if you can read Chinese, is actually kind of a presented to the emperor, right, Taishu emperor, and also royal dignities. Right? And uh, this is called the Taishu canon, right, membership list. Right? So we examine the list, it's a long, it's, it's a long kind of a list. Then you have a Koreans, Korean monasteries, uh, Chinese, for example, I have a Hu name here, right? the famous Chinese intellectual Hu Shi, naturally listed here. 
So what it shows is that actually the Taisho compilers were aware of the existence of the lost texts probably somewhere in Asia. They actually reach out, try to uh, solicit uh, submission, right? Just submission, right? And we later, for, for some of you probably know Yang Wenhui, for example, right? So this is one of the great modern Chinese Buddhists actually went to London, right? He, he, he kind of met Nanjiu Buyu in London. So, so they kept a close connection throughout their lifetime and the sending texts, exchange texts quite often. And the texts, Asian texts discovery in China, the one example I have is uh, Shen Qin. I mentioned Shen Qin's work of Bei Shan Lu, the record of Northern Mountain, uh, because it, it, it contains one passing reference to the Kai Bao Canon, so I, I mentioned this. This book actually was discovered during the Republican period by the great historian Chen Yuan. Right? So there are actually two separate copies. Both of them are not complete, but the Chen Yuan put them together, make that complete. So the Japanese, if you see the Taishu Canon, that edition actually took from Chen Yuan's reprint. Right? But however, if you use that to study, the, the Taishu Canon simply omit the colophon, which is very important, because the colophon contains uh, Shen Qin's biography. Right? Shen Qin's biography. And uh, so, so what happened is that right, the Taishu Canon, as I said, right, so this shows you the evidence. It's absolutely uh, uh, East Asian effort. Of course, the Japanese uh, maintained the leadership. Right? So then, let's go through some uh, kind of a dry, hard evidence about Taishu Ken. Right? First, about the two compilers, right? uh, Takakusu Junjigo. Right? So this is one of the major uh, leaders in the compilation. Right? Wanatabe uh, Kaigyuku. So these two. Right? So they worked from 1922 to 1934, right? Devoted themselves to the compilation. Right? So this canon included texts, translated sources from Indian, China, Japan, and Korea. So it's very comprehensive. Right? More, most of them were written in Chinese right, before the 13th century. So you have the standard. This Taisho canon actually, actually uh, is not that useful for me. So I study later period, right? way after 13th century, 17th century. So you see their, their cutoff line is 13th century. So anything after that, you know, not, 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 not even worse to, to be included. So, and also what is uh, interesting is that they included Japanese authors. They included more Japanese writings into the canon, of course, right? so the Japanese were the compilers. So eventually, the, the edition contains 3,493 titles. This is so far the largest. Very comprehensive. 100, 100 volumes. Among those, these volumes, 55 volumes contain translated texts from India and Central Asia. And Chinese writings. Uh, and also 29 volumes includes uh, Japanese texts written in Chinese, right, with Japanese authors. So this is very unique. Right? Uh, you, uh, usually the, on the China side, Chinese canon uh, will not include writing. They, they include writings by the Koreans, by the way. If they stay in China right, uh, and uh, write in Chinese, uh, but very few contains Japanese texts. Right? And also, so very updated and scholarly advance is that they included newly discovered Dunhuang texts. So I mentioned Dunhuang's study became prominent during that time, and this got reflected in the Taishu Canon, right, in the, in the Taishu Canon, so 85, right. So the Sibeta, right, I mentioned the digitization project, right, they digitized 1 to 55, and plus 85. They, they just leave out the Japanese part, Japanese part. So if you want to say the C beta, you probably can't find the entire Kai Taishu. But you have to go to SAT. I mentioned this Japanese uh, digitization project, SAT. Right? So that's the different approach uh, for digitization. There are also many other advantages for revolutionary uh, features, such as including iconographical sessions. 
which means Buddhist icon. If you walk into a Buddhist temple, you see the statue. Actually, is a very rich iconographic tradition within Buddhism because to build those temple, have paintings, Buddha is a special knowledge about how to build a statue, right? So the iconography is actually very rich in Buddhist tradition, and Taishu include 12 volumes of that, 12 volumes of that. Right? And the Taishu also includes all the surviving catalogs. This is tremendously valuable for anybody who wants to study the canon, because all the catalogs in history, it has been put in three separate volumes. So then you can check them against each other. So remember, this is, at that time, there's no digital or something. It's not so convenient if you want to consult different editions. Uh, so one printed page, later we will I will show you the layout, right? Usually have a three registers, we call that registers. And the result of collation will be added at the bottom of the page. So it's a scholarly work and requires collation. Right? All texts were punctuated paper. So this, this is probably most kind of a hidden secret for Chinese texts. For Asian texts in Chinese, there's no punctuation. No punctuation. Right? So a lot of even Chinese don't know that. Right? But this is a secret or this is basic knowledge. You have to know how to punctuate them. Punctuate them. So this creation, which, which is greatly facilitated reading, not just for the Japanese, but for Chinese or foreigners as well. Right? If I remember correctly, there's also uh, Yomi Takushi there, uh, the Japanese way of uh, uh, reading. Because Japanese read Chinese, they can read Chinese, but they have to put their marker there to indicate which one is the verb which one is the subject. So the Japanese grammar actually reverse the order, uh, reverse the order. So there's great amount of kind of effort to be made to make that available to the Japanese so Japanese can read Chinese texts. Okay, so here is a layout, typical layout of the Taisho canon, right? So let me see, okay, so I have, uh, let me call out all of this. Uh, think. So you have three registers. We call this a register. One, two, three, A, B, C. So you have three registers, and on one side you always have a catalog numbers. And so this number represents a unique, this unique number for that title only. So remember in the past we used the southern character as a way to organize this. Right now that's all gone. So we shift to a numerical number. A numerical number. So then, right, so if you count that actually uh, the kind of the continuity with tradition has maintained about the number of characters in a given line or a column here, it's going to be 17. Right? So this is actually standard format if, if you examine the Dunhuang manuscript. The Dunhuang manuscript is standard. By the way, the, the Kaibao is not standard. Kaibao, each line, 14. 14 characters. This one is standard. Right? So then 29 lines per register. Right? If you count it each register, 29 lines. So this has somehow become a very uh, useful layout. And you also have festival numbers printed here. Right? So this small one here. Uh, let me see what else. A page number, right? So here. Right? Uh, so this, what, what is this? Okay. And here, then at the bottom, you will see this simple annotation, which tells you the variations the Taisho com compilers identified when they compare Korean canon, right, which is their mother copy, with other editions. Right? If they identify a discrepancy such as a character, they don't say, OK, this is wrong. However, they recorded in other edition, this character should be something else. It right? should be something else. So it's a scholarly edition. It's very useful to be able to uh, 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 kind of uh, consult this. In this canon, there are about 400 uh, titles of rare sources which never appeared in any previous, previous canon. 
what this what this says is that the value of Taishu, right, it, it has something even the Chinese did not see. Right? This is because the Japanese students right, in ancient time they traveled to China and brought back texts they were preserved in Japanese uh, monastery. So those were available during that time. Uh, when they compiled the canon, so they simply corroborate that. Those, of course, those were Chinese. Right? Those were Chinese texts. Right? They were very available, uh, 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 valuable. Right? So there, there are different kind of a type of texts I, I you know, lay out here. So the texts included in the canon are based on Tripitaka Kriyana. As I said, it's a mother copy here, and collated with the three other editions. The Chinese Zifu, Puning, and the Jiaxin Canon. Right? The Japanese call them in different names. Later, later I will tell you. And the Taisho Canon focused primarily on the translations and early Chinese writings and Japanese writings. Right? So more than 150 titles which have appeared in major Chinese edition but were excluded from this edition. So what it, what it means is that because the cutoff line is 13th century, so there are texts already being in the canon, they just get, get rid of that. Right? They, just, they, they don't want to kind of use the later texts. So I didn't translate this one, but if you look, this will tell you where comes the Taishu canon. Right? So I can just explain to you, this is Taishu. So we trace back to history, then the, the primary source for uh, them is the newly compiled small print edition. But of course, small print is based on Korean, right? And the Korean based on the Kaiba. Right? But however, there's another source for the Japanese because the Japanese monastery, Imperial Library, contains, preserved, lots of lost texts right, from China. The Chinese will no longer have them, but because the Japanese they went to China to study the broad back, so it preserved in Japan. So that got into the Taishu. And of course, there are other traditions, right? Jiaxing canon, uh, Ming dynasty canon, Yuan dynasty, Song dynasty, right? So different traditions trickle it down and make Taishu canon one of the greatest. Okay. So then I will, I will zoom in into history and uh, tell you uh, about the actual publication process, right? how this actually was made. So according to my uh, knowledge, right, I learned this from uh, online source, right, so I think it must be credible, right? Uh, it supplies a lot, lot more detail. Right? It turned out to be Takakusu Junjiro. He, is a, he was a professor of the Tokyo University, and he actually started this by using his own residence. Right? So actually, all start from his own residence. He established this institute, and uh, I have the uh, uh, address of that. The next time I visit Tokyo, I will try to find this place. I will try to find this place. And the mother copy actually came in from the Zojojin, that's one of the major temples in Tokyo. As I believe this is the Shogun's, Shogun's family temple by Zojojin. So they preserve uh, the, the Goryeo, Songyuan, Ming edition. So they, they basically go there to, to do the collation work. In addition, right, the imperial palace agency allowed them to use the royal collection from Social Yin. Right? So this is located in Nara. So this summer I went to Nara. It's right behind the Todai, the great Toji, behind the Toji, the great huge Toji. After that, uh, but I, I want to go inside. They say, okay, they have a renovation project. So the facility is closed. Right? But Social Yin preserved lots of uh, Asian uh, uh, Nara period manuscript, which is very, very precious. But they were allowed to use that. Right? So that they have an advantage uh, of doing that. Right? But however, if you remember history, 1923, there was a great earthquake happened in Japan, right, devastated the entire Tokyo area. Right? So a temporary office was set in one room of uh, Takakusu's uh, uh, residence. Right? And the first volume pu published in the second year, right, 1924. Right? So we have uh, 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 further evidence shows this is uh, 
very much motivated by the Japanese nationalistic sentiment because the first, vo first volume uh, after the publication, there was a dedication ceremony, uh, uh, I think, was held in the Ueno Park. Right? So now there's the Ueno Park. Uh, so there's a uh, fine arts institute, there's an auditorium, and uh, the dedication ceremony is held there. And the copy, first copy was dedicated to the Shotoku Taishi, right? so one of the legendary founders of Japanese Buddhism, the Shotoku Taishi. And uh, then the publication uh, effort continues. There's an association of Taisho Canon public publication established and reorganized later as a uh, company. So it's a joint venture uh, company. And moved to another location, right? Hogyo, right? So this is a kind of a cultural area, right? Hogyo Daigaku uh, University is located there as well. Uh, so then there's a publication company being established in 32, and uh, eventually it was published in uh, the whole volume, finished in 1934, right, with this number. Right? So once again, I have a, uh, a series of numbers. Right? Uh, so I want to find the first edition of 1934 edition. Right? So far, I, I haven't seen that. Right? This is going to be different from the later prints, because I know there are color prints, right? and uh, there are different kind of a layout, probably. Not layout, but a higher way of devising the volumes. Right? There may be some, something interesting. But however, we were able to find something very interesting from the British uh, Oxford University Library. And so this is a, one of the uh, uh, prospectors of the Taisho Canon. When Taisho Canon was about to, to be compiled, uh, Takakuzu Jinjiro actually uh, translated that into an English pamphlet, actually only four pages, right? and sent that to Stein. Stein Aru right. Stein was the person who lead the expedition in Doha. So they kept communication during that time. And to tell him that they were doing this, so it's completely in English, tell you what's this about. It's a publication of a new edition of the Tripitaka in English, revised, collated, added, and rearranged. Right? So it gives details about those kind of uh, people who were involved, right? Uh, Takaku Jinjiro, right here, uh, and also in other pages, it just give you give people a content of, of its uh, uh, the table of content. Most interesting is to give you the price. Right? This has been sold for a profit. And the last page is about price. Right? So it's more like a subscription kind of a pamphlet for people to uh, uh, subscribe to the channel. So this is kind of a rare, right? So right now become a rare source. And only can find in uh, 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 overseas. Uh, I didn't check the Japanese library. Probably can find some, but this is for English speaker. You can see they send out. But I doubt it's Japanese actually preserve those. So then, in 1944, uh, because that's the end, of, almost the end of the war, the, the military government in, in Japan they reorganize things. So the Tripitaka Publication Company no longer exists. They have been put under this name for some time. And after doing the war, the bombing, and then the warehouse simply burned down. Right? So all of the remaining copies no longer exist. So no way you can print from the old uh, uh, typeset anymore. Right? So then after the war in 1946, the company was restored and they start to organize to reprint the Taishu, right? From 60 to 76, right? So they reprinted Taishu, they right? reprinted Taishu. Right? Also, right, uh, one of the invaluable addition to the original Taishu is the publication of index, right? So index are very useful, very useful for scholars. Not only to every word, but also provides the Sanskrit. Right, Sanskrit or Tibetans, right? the cross-reference, which is very uh, 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 useful. Right? There are 45 volumes, 45 volumes. Right? So a lot of work 
to be done. And six Buddhist universities participate. I will make this happen. Make this happen. Okay. So this is the book, right? The original Taisho catalog. Right? I found a copy from Harvard Engine Library. Right? Together with the membership list. I appended at the end. Right? So I haven't compared right, how they changed. Right? I got to be some change after they published that. Right? It's got to be rearrangement. Right? So this is my fingers, and unfortunately only three showed up. Right? I probably should have put a five there. <laughs> a three, you know. So here, let's go over the, the changes Taishu made against the old structure. Right? I showed you in the first lecture, Jisheng, his standard catalog. Right? But however, Taishu made the changes, as, as we know, right? so then exactly what it looks like. Right? So this is a, ultimately the Taishu structure. And let me tell you the kind of a principle the Taishu comp compiler followed. Uh, largely, they follow the chronological order. You remember the uh, Chinese, the Jisheng, the Tang Dynasty catalog, they, they adopt some kind of a classification of the teaching, so they put Mahayana in the beginning, right? Follows Prajna Paramita as a top. Right? Clearly, they have a sense which teaching is the most important for Chinese or Mahayana people. But however, one of the change Taishu made is a shift to a chronological order. That means to uh, list the earliest Buddhist teaching in the beginning, right? So then you have the Agama text in the, in the beginning. This is a Buddhist teaching, right? Buddhist word here, right? Where you can say this is a Hinayana or Theravada tradition, not even Mahayana. But however, of course, the Chinese translate those. So you see the first type of source no longer is Prajna Paramita, right? So largely you can say they follow a chronological order. Right? So the main canon, right, main content for 55 volumes start with the Agama texts and then move to uh, Buddhist biology, uh, biography and disciples' biography. So you follow a logic that is closely related to chronology. So then you have a Mahayana Sutras in three sections, largely right, follows the old classification. Right? You have a, a Mahayana a, a, a canon, right? usually you have these different sections. Another creation is the esoteric teaching as a separate session. So in, in, the, in the old catalog, actually, there's no separate session for esoteric teaching. Uh, there, there are supplements, there are esoteric scriptures, but here, a separate esoteric teaching has been attached. That's one of the reasons, probably, because uh, esoteric teaching, actually, is very influential in Japan. Right? You know, the Shingun tradition, right? the two words tradition that's esoteric. Kukai came to China, and, and, and the Chinese esoteric simply disappeared after three great Tang masters. And then Japanese believe the tradition goes to Japan, right? That's Kukai. So esoteric teaching scheme as a separate. Uh, so Vinaya uh, uh, then follow with the commentaries. The right? commentaries of the sutra, right? So all the way we have Yogacara, right? Different kind of sex, sex, yeah, sectarian writings were put here. And the commentaries of the sutra, Vinaya, uh, Sastra, right? these are all done by the Chinese, uh, native Chinese. And uh, then, school of lineage, right? this will incorporate the Zen, mostly the Zen, the Zen recorded sayings. Uh, history and biography, right? so all those uh, uh, Buddhist history books will be included. Right? So this is very useful. Right? Source books like uh, encyclopedia, right? Dictionary, they will be included. And uh, non-Buddhist teaching, you see here? Right, so this is a kind of a visionary, the included non-Buddhist teaching. Because we know in Buddhist canon, there already something is not Buddhist. Right? But however, they were there. Uh, but however, the, here we have a separate uh, session and a catalog. As I mentioned, the catalogs are very important and helpful for us to study the previous canon. Right? And the supplemented content uh, has, has 30 volumes by Japanese authors. 
then largely they follow, uh, they, they focus on commentaries. If I understand, I, I, by the way, I, I don't understand the principle why some Japanese offer in Cincinnati, some are not. But look at this list, we probably can figure out uh, commentaries to scripture still are very important, so scripture in the center. And then you have the sectarian writings right, by different Japanese authors and liturgical texts. Now the Japanese, uh, I've been there two months, my, my feeling is that the Japanese care more about doing things, right? doing things correctly. Right? You have to bow right? it correctly, right? it is correct angle, right? doing, going to different places, following the right ritual, going to toilet, you change your kind of sleeper, right? So that, 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 that kind of a uh, thing. Right? So, so to do things, very important. Right? So then you have a lost Asian text session 85, and that's Dung Huang. Mostly Dung Huang, newly discovered Dung Huang text. So what is good about that is uh, uh, they, they all got printed. So Dung Huang text is because it's a manuscript, sometimes hard to, to decipher. But these are all printed with punctuation, by punctuation. And suspected text, which means apographer, and some apographer being included here. Then that's the iconographical <coughs> content I mentioned, 12 volumes of that. I cannot say anything about that part, right? because I don't know. Right? Because I don't know. So, but I know it's valuable, right? very valuable here. OK. So here, I want to conclude my lecture part. Right?